eliminating mess on your race car. And that's what we're going to be going through in uh, this. We're, wow, we're already at episode 5 <laughs> on our ER8 The Tick series. So excellent. And uh, yeah, much appreciated that you guys have been uh, going through the previous videos and leaving a lot of feedback on that. So that's why we continue with this. And of course, if we make it to the next one, we'll be going through our uh, Thor engine and details on that. But before we get there, so on uh, episode one, we went through uh, yeah, the basics about uh, what makes a fast race car, how to calculate that, and how to analytically approach situations. Uh, in episode two, we went through the simulation and manufacturing uh, cost situation so that to help figure out like, okay, what are things that can be done and what can't be done and what can we afford and how to spend the, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, well, whatever currency you're, you're using uh, most effectively to get the most performance possible. Um, yeah, we went through um, component performance also. That's um, yeah, a very, very difficult topic also on how to uh, evaluate different components and see which are the best ones. Uh, and yeah, previous episode we went through uh, downforce stuff, so that is of course one of the uh, main factors for that we went through in episode one on on what to, uh, what makes a fast race car. But now that we have all of these um, things gone through, um, of course the uh, next aspect is mass, and of course mass and weight are kind of used interchangeably, but that is completely wrong because mass is the actual, how should I say, physical mass of a of a component and weight is the mass times the uh, gravity uh, acceleration constant so that varies around the world not by much but a little bit and yeah we always want to go through the things and use correct names to uh, to reduce the amount of confusion as much as possible because there's a lot of confusion about everything so weight and mass are not the same thing and don't mix them up of course, if you're still using uh, these uh, legacy imperial units, you don't have a unit for uh, force, for instance, and you use a unit for mass for force, and then a unit for uh, for uh, mass and weight is the same. So, well, that is a standard unit also. So that helps helps create lots of confusion. But let's not get too involved in that. So we're talking about mass here. So, um... This topic about, so this is basically uh, boils down to uh, strength calculations. So you have lots of different loads on, on a vehicle or whatever it is that you're designing, uh, engine component, uh, suspension component, whatever. And uh, so depending on, on yeah, the load situation, you might be able to uh, yeah, make a really lightweight component or a really heavy component. And this topic is just much, much too big. It's the, the topic is about this big. And we have about this much of time available in the YouTube video. So I'm not going to be explaining um, too in depth or, or like trying to teach you about how to uh, calculate any kind of uh, strength calculations and stuff like that. There are probably YouTube videos that do that much better than, than, than what I would be able to do in this limited amount of time. But um, if you know some really good uh, videos about that or, or other uh, links for that, please leave them in the description below because uh, lots of people that are viewing this video are going to be interested in that. So help them out and uh, put some links in the description on this video. That will, would help out a lot. So what I am going to be going through, though, is explaining why it's very important to understand these, these uh, aspects and uh, not just yeah, build something and then just make it sort of thick enough or something like that that, that uh, you typically see and even in, in yeah I've had some uh, experiences with uh, formula student teams for instance where where uh, the uh, official evaluators that are working on F1 teams or something like that I mean have absolutely no clue what the, how these uh, strength calculation things work and it's oh, that's just a, a completely horrible situation but yeah, I mean, in the end, it's not that difficult, really. You just need to, to focus and figure out, okay, I want to understand how things work. And um, yeah, so, but to um, get this a little bit more concrete, I have uh, one good example from uh, the university there at a, at a lightweight structures, something like that. I think the course would be in the English translation for that. 
and I have some uh, videos for some different uh, structures for that and uh, that will maybe help sort of illustrate the situation with uh, some clear examples so I'm going to be going through that and then some generic stuff about uh, cards really really shortly after that uh, but yeah so first I'll explain the sort of yeah the so this um, course that, that I had at the university so basically um, I can't remember exactly how many students we have but we were yeah divided into um, uh, small teams and uh, each team had a, a team manager and basically um, it was a, a freely supported uh, a structure that needed to be built to support the weight of the uh, team manager and so of course immediately you have a huge advantage if you have a very heavy team manager uh, well uh, uh, because the point situation was that it would be scored based on the ratio of the uh, of the um, weight in this case of the team manager in relation to the MS of the of the support structure you had built um, so let's quickly go through this so we had a um, it's a freely supported structure so you only have so this is basically yeah one support and another support and this is like attached to, uh, to the ground or in the case of this example a, a really thick beam underneath this and so basically you have like some kind of a right, let's actually use a different color for this maybe some dark green so you basically have a, a unlimited space but in practice you are limited probably to something like this oops running out of space here so you have a, a area like this and you want to um, and yeah you have a force here on the center and you somehow need so this is basically the uh, team manager then standing on this structure whatever kind of structure you build here and this is not limited so you can make it wider or higher if you want to but this uh, height here was limited because uh, I can't remember exactly but there was some flex limit on how much that could go down around 20 millimeters something like that so yeah you have a force here and you of course need to transmit this somewhere so that this whole structure does, does drop down and that is at these points so you will have a counter force here at these points that will be if you have a centered force then then each of these will be half of this of course and yeah so what kind of a structure would you have i mean our team managers were probably uh, i think i was probably one of the uh, lighter weight team managers uh, with all the extra clothing and and as as I mean heavy stuff as I could pack on I think I weighed in at about 66 kilos or something like that and we there were some team managers that I think were around 100 kilograms something like that so I mean and oh yeah and this distance is of course important also so this was uh, one meter if I remember correctly so we have um, let's use some black color maybe for that so we have one meter distance here between these supports and uh, yeah so how much weight do you think um, would be needed in a situation like this like a, a 10 kilogram beam maybe could you get it maybe to to five kilograms one kilogram maybe even if you're really good or below one kilogram 500 grams maybe of course, uh, you guys that have worked on uh, composite stuff will probably have a, a much clearer idea on, on how things can be made. Of course, um, by, by that I don't mean that composite structures are better in any way than any type of other structures. But for doing these types of uh, custom designs, uh, composite is just much easier to form into an uh, efficient uh, way to bear loads. So that's the uh, reference to composite in this situation. Um, yeah, so we of course have um, some, I'm not sure if you're, okay, yeah, you're probably going to be able to see this. So if you have a, a supported structure like this and you apply a load in the center, this whole thing is, is going to uh, flex like this. Let's move this a little bit closer so you can see that. So, so yeah, this is of course, I mean, very intuitive and anyone will be able to understand that. And yeah, so how are you going to reduce weight? Of course, you need to have this stiff enough, so you need to make this 
this thick enough basically to to uh, hold the uh, load for that but then when you start going into strength calculation stuff of course if you start having this uh, really uh, thick structure then you're not using the material very efficiently in the center section and that's where you start getting into these uh, sandwich structures for instance which are very popular in a lot of different uh, situations so you have a stiff uh, top plane so you could for instance here use um, what color would we do maybe this so you can do maybe a, a top surface and a bottom surface here that are some some stiff uh, reasonably thin material Ah, and stiff so yeah this is something I need to explain also so stiff and uh, strong are completely different things so if something is very stiff it means for it means the the amount of flexure flex flexing flexure whatever uh, per uh, amount of load is is a uh, low so that means it's it's stiff and if something is flexible that means it it has a more flex for the same amount of load as a stiff structure and if something is strong that means what that basically uh, means how much the maximum load it can carry before it fails is so these are of course completely different things that that in some structures have something to do with each other but in most cases will be completely different things and in some cases also if you have a structure that is more flexible you can design it so that it flexes into a more into a better geometry to carry loads more efficiently for instance so yeah you can have it's very very uh, feasible to have a structure that is very flexible and very strong and likewise you can also have a structure that is very very stiff but uh, not strong at all so so these are completely separate concepts and these are yeah one of the more important things to understand and know about and there are probably going to be videos explaining that in a, in a much much better and clearer way so so yeah but uh, check the descriptions below someone might have uh, have posted a good link uh, explaining all of these these things um so so yeah if we have a yeah one plate up here and one plate down here and uh, just load it basically of course you need to connect these in some way so if you just connect these with like uh, thin support structures here then you basically just have two like very flexible pieces that are going to flex so you need to connect these somehow so now let's go back a little bit so when you load this up you would have like these this type of a movement well, it's not very smooth but anyway so and here you can of course clearly see when this flexes down and this barely moves so the distance between these points in relation to these points is different so basically you need to have some material between here to take up this so you basically have this uh, shear loading here where the more you flex this center part down you have basically a shear loading here so you want to have a material that is good for shear loading in the center and uh, for um, and of course the more shear loading or the more shear stiffness you have uh, the more you can have compression on this uh, top surface and uh, tension on this bottom surface and in case of, of just like uh, support structures in in this sort of a vertical direction you would have almost no shear loading at all so you would just have two completely separately loaded surfaces and that's not a very ideal um, way to to make a, this type of a structure um, yeah so uh, when we're looking at something like this I mean this would be a, a very typically easy solution to do which uh, most people would assume is, is reasonably efficient so you have a sandwich structure which is generally assumed to be very efficient uh, but if you start sort of analyzing this thing and uh, doing the actual numbers for this which I'm not going to do here because yeah we don't have that much time uh, so basically you, you would end up with a lot of material to uh, to take up these shear loads and that ends up weighing a lot and the shear loads is, is not sort of like beneficial actually for your structure if you can reduce the amount of shear loading you have then you need um, yeah less material to take that up and it's not really something that is is like necessary for your structure so then um, one solution that that uh, we uh, looked at or or I mean I think it's more or less analytically the the uh, best 
uh, sort of structure to do. Uh, so basically you have uh, compressive loads at the top and tension at the bottom. So and you want to reduce the shear loads completely. So you just want to connect these points basically together. So you can do a structure like this. And then of course because these are freely supported you need something to prevent these feet from, from stretching outwards. So you need another structure here. And uh, yeah, once you figure this out, you you can be reasonably sure that that this is like analytically the the most efficient way because you have a direct load path uh, for the compressive forces on the top, and you have a direct load path for the tension forces at the bottom, and then it's just a question of optimizing the structure really. So you have a uh, compressive forces here at the top, and you will of course uh, choose a, a structure for this that is uh, has the uh, highest possible uh, buckling. Um, buckling resistance uh, per per mass, of course, and uh, for this uh, tension section here, you yeah choose a structure that has the the uh, best best uh, tension uh, loading per mass, basically. And yeah, so the uh, whole situation gets uh, very easy, and then yeah, you just design these, and then you need something at the ends here to to connect these two pieces together but the closer you bring these together also uh, the better that is because yeah if you have this uh, high this um, really tall sandwich structure then you have yeah tension on or compression on one side and tension on the other side and that basically yeah the the higher that is the the more total total sort of force you have of course you gain uh, geometrically wise uh, more on the stiffness of that, but the higher you make it the more material you need But with this you don't need any type of material in this center section at all So yeah, this is uh, what we looked at and optimized this uh, on our structure and yeah, I think This pretty much um, Should explain this so let's jump into the video. This is a really old one. So this was in the uh, four to three video days, so Let's go through this, and I can, uh, yeah, explain something while we go while we go through this. Um, so, if you thought about the different weights of what possibly could be achievable, um, the professor set set uh, a reasonably ambitious target of 300 grams for the structure, so that if we could make a support structure that was under 300 grams, then we would get automatically a one point added added to our uh, course grade. And um, yeah, of the of all of these, I think uh, I lost track already. But I think there was one or two before this one. Um, I believe this one was maybe around 800 grams. This was uh, oh, I can't remember these anymore. But this one was probably at least over 500 grams. So so I mean yeah, 300 grams is definitely a reasonably ambitious uh, target, and these are. Yeah, university students, so so pretty much the uh, smartest smartest guys you're you're going to be find on sort of a larger scale at least. So this is a typical uh, sandwich structure here, which they've uh, lightened with uh, holes through the through the uh, center section there that takes up this this uh, shear loading. So you can still like space out the top and bottom surface a lot, but sort of reduce the amount of uh, mass you have in the center section. And I believe this was around uh, 800, 850 grams, something like that, and uh, that worked worked fine. And here you can see, uh, so the, these guys have uh, clearly figured this out. So you have this this uh, bridge structure with this uh, wedge type shape here, but these ends here are very very flat, and you still have to hold up the uh, the half of the force loading here. And this like height seems to be a little bit skinny here. And this center section is flexing down and being supported by the by this um, uh, piece here. And yeah, you can see when they remove that, it will yeah will have a, a failure here on on the edge here. But this was also a reasonably heavy structure. Uh, so this is uh, our structure. And any guesses what this weighs? So uh, 300 grams uh, was the uh, was the was the uh, yeah. Professor uh, set set target weight, and we weighed in at uh, I believe 160 grams, so half of that. And 
most of that weight was actually these uh, end sections here, which could have been much, much uh, lighter weight. So uh, I calculated that we could have gotten this down to 60 grams uh, with some uh, lighter weight uh, end pieces here. And so, yeah, and it's of course the most important thing here is to, is to understand the loads and what's happening. So we have a, a, a solid structure here uh, with uh, so basically a foam centerpiece just to use as a mold to hold the uh, carbon fiber uh, outer section and it's just a single layer basically to get the uh, the uh, maximum amount of, of buckling uh, strength but we were um, not limited at all uh, let me just uh, pause this quickly oh, I'll try to pause it oh, damn it uh, let me just jump back shortly um, well this okay yeah um, so I can explain this. Um, yeah, so uh, this size of this uh, top beam here, we were uh, limited by by our uh, manufacturing capabilities. So we did these by hand, and I think we yeah estimated that we couldn't go thinner than was it maybe 12 or 12 millimeter or something like that. We could have gone much smaller than that. And for the uh, bottom. Uh, section here we basically we, or we're not basically we have a uh, dry carbon fiber strands here because uh, the epoxy or the uh, matrix material for that is only useful for holding the uh, fibers in place they don't actually that material doesn't actually contribute much to the uh, load carrying capability depending on the loading situation of course uh, but in this case we have a uh, pure tension through these so there is no point in in uh, adding any any matrix material all, at all we just have uh, some here at the end to to basically glue them to these end pieces that support the uh, weight here on the supports and uh, yeah we have this uh, center section here to add a little bit of rotational rigidity as you saw from the video it was extremely sort of wobbly and this was also one of the limiting factors we were looking at that okay how much stiffness do we need there so that will be uh, possible to stand on there for I think it was two or three seconds, something that was the uh, limit that it needs to to be able to uh, support the team manager. And uh, yeah, we just barely managed to do, do that. But we had some really interesting stuff also with that. I mean, again, to to highlight, I mean, not not to yeah talk bad, badly of, about people unnecessarily, but yeah, at the university, one of my uh, probably main hobbies there was was to uh, point out uh, mistakes that the uh, that the professors are are making in their different lectures and and comments and points and stuff like that so <laughs> definitely had a lot of fun with this because at the uh, weigh-in for this for instance uh, the uh, course assistants uh, and the professor um, all said that this was uh, completely designed wrong and there was uh, no way that this was going to be able to uh, hold the load at all and we even had, and that they also said that this was going to flex way too much. And we basically have a little bit of a preload here also. So this uh, center uh, foam piece here is a little bit higher than, than what it uh, would be freely supported. And that's basically to put some tension on this. So that basically means that we're already losing a little bit of free space here. But our calculations show that, yeah, we would have like, a, I can't remember what it was, like one or two millimeters of flex or something like that. So it basically... The most um, rigid uh, support structure of, of any of the different uh, teams here and it was uh, by far the strongest I think we had um, I think I we uh, we calculated that we were sort of estimating around uh, three or four times higher load carrying capability than 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 the uh, yeah the the mass or the uh, well in this case the weight applied by <laughs> by me standing on that was but I mean, again, we were limited by by how small of a structure we can reliably make by hand. So that was the uh, limiting factor with this. But yeah, it was fun with the, discussing with the professor beforehand. Like, okay, is this structure going to work or not? Well, that's what this test is for. So we can figure that out. And and yeah, it held up fine exactly as we calculated. And the funny thing is that the professor, so they still uh, reduced uh, our points on the report because they still claim that we had calculated the strength of the, of the piece wrong <laughs> so uh, that's so fun but um yeah so my philosophy at the university was always that if you get a one so uh, so the uh, scaling was a zero to five and a zero was uh, failed failed and a one to five was everything passed so yeah a one is like the optimum 
the uh, optimum amount of, of work put in to get the same amount of, of sort of uh, courses through. Uh, of course, yeah, learning is the most important thing, but learning and getting a good grade in the courses are sometimes not the same thing. So I think uh, yeah, this was one of the more funnier courses for, for that. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, go through this. Um, this was probably one of the more innovative. So this was by far the the uh, best sort of a workload uh, to uh, structure component. I mean, it looks really lightweight, but this actually weighed in at 260 grams. So this was 100 grams uh, heavier. So this is just a sawed off ice hockey stick. But the wall thickness here is so thick that it ends up weighing a lot, even though it's, yeah, there's almost nothing there. But uh, yeah, we beat them out on the uh, on the um, well, weight to mass ratio quite a lot. So R really nice <laughs> solution with that. Um, yeah, so um, bringing this back to sort of um, vehicle structures and stuff like this, I mean, um, this video is probably drawing out way too long already, so I'm not going to be digging up uh, comparison things on the internet but but uh, sort of yeah just to do some wishy-washy explanations about uh, what I'm going after so if you have um, uh, what is it uh, suspension mounting points for instance you just need to figure out okay which which where do I need to get the suspension forces uh, so they're being applied to some uniball or or if you have some other bushings or whatever to the mounting point for that and okay where do these forces need to go and what is the most efficient way to do that and understand how these structures work? Okay, do I have, do I need to take buckling into consideration or not? Uh, how stiff does the structure need to be? Are there going to be any vibration issues? So what is the mass to stiffness ratio need to be? And um, yeah, what are the uh, sort of construction problems potentially going to be? Are there going to be any shock loadings or not that need to be taken into consideration? Uh, that also, of course, uh, affects the vibration stuff a lot also. But these all, all are things to think about. And yeah, once you do that, okay, you can have something that looks very simple is, is usually the best. So yeah, you have beams that go directly between suspension mounting points and some cross bracing or, or um, yeah, closed uh, uh, sort of, um, what are they called? Uh, like that maybe. And yeah, these will be very efficient. And then when you see structures that have like, like multiple beams going in all kinds of different directions. So, so yeah, when you see something like this, and then you have like a structure that goes here, and then one that goes here, and then you have a suspension mounting point here. So then you have a structure that goes here, and then this guy maybe goes over here, and then this has some support that goes over here, and then you're like, like uh, dudes, no, <laughs> that's not the way to do that. So if you have a loading point here and you need to whatever move it over here then you add a beam here and then you if this is like a rigid support point then you can maybe add like a support here to get this buckling force down or something like that and you don't have if you, as long as soon as you see like there are like multiple beams going in the same direction or very close to each other or like these strange section things then then yeah no run run because <laughs> yeah Someone like adding lots of mass to um, be able to cope with higher forces is is not a good sign. If you understand things and and um, do a good structure, it doesn't necessarily need to be any more expensive or or any more difficult to manufacture at all. Uh, but it's sort of you have a kind of like almost inverse correlation there. If you're looking at uh, two different parts that are claimed to uh, hold the same amount of loading and well okay one could be like <laughs> like cheating and doesn't know at all what they're saying uh, but yeah usually you, you will see that the lighter weight component will be stronger also because the, the guy that designs the lighter weight component uh, will understand the uh, this uh, solid mechanics better and will be able to design the component better and it will be stronger and as stiff or as flexible as required and lighter weight also and of course yeah this is maybe what what you want to look into also so don't just add stuff all over but try to figure out what is it that we want to achieve and how to achieve that in the um, most efficient way possible 
Um, yeah, but I think this is stretching out way too far already. So, um, saying goodbye and in the next episode... Yeah, I mean, we're on episode 5 already, so we're probably definitely going to jump to episode 6 and that will be all about our Thor engine and what we've designed and what we haven't designed and what's good and bad and what the main points are and, and yeah, what are just uh, plain average numbers that you can do with any engines and yeah, so look forward to that. Uh, but yeah, I'm Oscar from Elmer Racing. Uh, this has been episode 5 of our ER8 The Tech Series. See you next time. Bye.